when I go to, to go to a state of flow, I just that, ooh, that f- would feel really good right now to be, you know, and if you're, any of your viewers or listeners uh, haven't experienced that, I really, that that's a part of life that I feel nobody should miss. Uh, it, it helps to have a passion. And I don't know, that's a very important part of life. And not everyone has a passion. But if you have a passion, that's the way to get into flow is to just devote yourself, take away all distractions, take away all time constraints. I go to the desert to write, go to some place in the middle of nowhere sometimes and stay a week and write from 9 a.m. till midnight every day. Whoa. Leonard Mladenov, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Tom. Dude, your background is weird enough that I feel compelled to like give people a quick nutshell. So theoretical physicist who's written books with Stephen Hawking, uh, used to write for TV, which is crazy. Some of like the seminal shows that I grew up with, including MacGyver, Night Court. Um, but you also write nonfiction books about incredible subjects. And the one we're going to be talking about today is emotional. Um, and did I get sort of the rough thumbnail sketch right? That you did. You did leave out Star Trek: The Next Generation, That's which right. always right. people Star are Trek always did. interested in. But I never. <laughs> I think I have seen maybe half an episode of Star Trek. Full stop. From OG Star Trek through all of them, it never. Um, it somehow just didn't make my radar in any sort of full and complete way. But now that I'm meeting you, I'm very sad. Have, well, you know what? Next Generation is is the best one, and of those, second season. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> my season, if, if we may. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about emotions today just to set people up. I think ultimately you and I agree on sort of the role that emotion plays, but there's one thing that I'm so intrigued to go back and forth on, which is if I'm getting your stance correct, emotions are incredibly important and we would be absolutely paralyzed without them. And you, I think it's Paul Dirac, is Mm -hmm. that the physicist's name, um, who, you sum up as sort of being as close to a robot as a human can get. And if you don't mind, give us a quote that he said when asked how he was so successful. Remember this, this for everybody listening, this is the guy who's considered to be sort of robot-like. Robot-like and one of the top physicists of the 20th century and responsible for a lot of quantum theory, which is what the whole modern world works on. And when he was asked later in life what his key to success in physics was, he said, be guided most of all by your emotions. <laughs> That's so crazy. So I knew a little bit about uh, Dirac, but I had not heard that, so I was super surprised. Um, so I agree, and, and some of the most fascinating brain science is around people who've had their emotional centers destroyed, and they literally can't make a decision because you need your emotions to push you in a direction. But I don't trust my emotions. And so while I agree that my emotions are what push and pull me in a direction, I'm super curious what your take is on should we trust our emotions or should we be trying to shape them and can we shape them or are they just whatever they are? Well, that, there's a lot there. <laughs> <laughs> As a human a member of the human species, we're given a certain emotional machinery and it, it, that machinery has a very important role to play in our thinking. So one of the mistakes that people make when they talk about emotions is to say that emotions are counterproductive or even separate from rational thinking, people make a dichotomy between emotions and rational thinking. And, and one thing that the last 10, 20 years of neuroscience and uh, psychology research has figured out is that, that that's not possible, that emotions go hand in hand with rational thinking. There is no rational thinking without emotion. If you think, I'm, this, the, if you think at any point I'm thinking purely objectively and rationally without any emotion, you're just wrong. And it's not just me saying that. That's, I've been told that by many of the leading researchers in, in the field. And here's how it works. Your, your brain is an information processor. So data comes in, your sensory data of what you're seeing, uh, data about what your situation is, and, and your, your brain processes that information, not really like a computer does, much differently, which we can get into if you want later, but yeah. in a much different way. And it's, but, but like a... Uh, um, a computer, it processes that information, that data, and it gives you some output. The output might be a thought, a decision, a behavior. And think about what's going on in the brain as it's processing. Uh, your, your brain has a certain capability of executing logic. For instance, it knows if A implies B and B implies C, 
then A implies C. So this logical thinking and rational rules are in, in your brain as it's processing. But like any computer, any processing system, when it's processing it, it's not just the, the, the grinding through the logic that, that has to happen. You, you need a question to be asked you need the, the, the program to be designed to, to output something, mm. and you need data to come in. Your brain needs to know, as it's, as it's answering a question or making a decision, it's looking at uh, the situation, uh, your knowledge, your beliefs, your past experience. It's evaluating all that, and it's, it, it's evaluating the probability that certain things are true and certain things aren't true. It's, it's weighing how important is this fact that I know or remember or believe, how important is that fact. And only when all that has been done can that pure, uh, rational, logical calculation be you know, crunched through the data. First, the data has to be presented and evaluated. And your emotions, that's where they come in. They, they are key to what data is going to be evaluated, how it's going to be looked at, how, how skeptical you're going to be about it, how much weight you're going to give it. And without the data and the question being asked and the data to work on, the processor does nothing. Mm -hmm. So the processor has to have the clothing of all this data uh, and, and all this information and all these goals that you want to answer in order to, in order to go in and go through its life and process something. So in that way, the, the processor and the emotion cannot, they don't operate separately. They always operate together. So when you ask the question, should I trust my emotion? Well, Every thought that you have is influenced by your emotions. E each emotion is, is a state, a different state of being of that processor. Uh, some emotions tend to weigh certain elements more and other elements less or give certain things more importance or less or certain things uh, it's more skeptical or less and so forth, depending on your emotion state. If you're in a state of disgust, that's one set of, of parameters that governs your, your thinking. If you're in a state of fear, there's another one and so forth. And so as you're processing, you're, you're in a certain state that's determined by your emotion, and that determines how the processing turns out. And this is something that developed over millions of years as we were evolving, and it's important to note that we were evolved in the wild, not in mm -hmm. a society like this. So, so there are situations where it's not optimal, where, where your emotions do take you astray, like perhaps you, you have too strong an emotion or it's not, it, it, it's the kind of emotion that would have been appropriate out in the wild, but not in today's fast changing world. For example, emotions have something called persistence, which means that they don't go away right away. If I see a bear in, on the trail and then he disappears into the bushes, I don't suddenly, I go back to my cheery <laughs> self, I, I remain afraid, which is good because he may still be there. So mm -hmm. that's a, a purpose for that. But if I'm in a meeting with my boss, and we have a big fight and I'm angry, and then I go to the next meeting, it's not good that the anger carries on. So there are cases where emotions are inappropriate or we overreact or because of our upbringing, we have a tendency to over, you know, to exaggerate certain feelings. And so there are ways that we can talk about to handle that. But I, I liken that to optical illusions. Your, your, your eyes get fooled sometimes. There's mirages or all those optical illusions you can find online that where you can't believe what you're seeing, yeah. right? We don't say, I better not use my eyes anymore because sometimes they're wrong. <laughs> we go, no, eyes are, uh, evolve for a purpose, but there's some artificial situations where they're wrong. And emotions evolve for a purpose, a very key purpose. They're a key to our thinking and our, all, our, all our deciding. But especially in today's very weird world, there are, there are situations where, where they steer you wrong. Mm. All right, my friend, I have a big announcement. My incredible and talented wife, Lisa, is about to launch her new book, Radical Confidence. In it, she has managed to perfectly capture the process of how to go from feeling lost and insecure to taking control of your life and doing amazing things despite feeling fear, sometimes a lot of fear. Now, let me tell you, nobody knows Lisa better than me, but when I read Radical Confidence for the first time and heard her describe what it was like for her to go from having these big, exciting dreams as a kid to then as an adult, scheduling her life around the TV shows that she wanted to watch or how lonely and isolated she felt instead of pursuing her dreams, it was brutal for me. I would never say though that it was worth it for her to go through all of that just so that she could write something down that allows others to avoid it, but I will say that at least she was able to capture the strategies that she used to break out of that rut, find her voice, and begin doing incredible 
terrible things despite her insecurities and fears that she wasn't going to be good enough to achieve great things. So while it hurts me to know the dark place that Lisa went through, I really am excited for people who are going through something similar right now to read this book. Radical Confidence is an instruction manual for how to become the hero of your own life even when you're scared to death. Look, I know better than just about anybody how easy it is to get off track in life or to just not have yet found your calling. And it's even easier for people to feel so insecure and unprepared that they don't even want to pursue the things that they want. But what Lisa shows people in radical confidence is that the radical part is that you can accomplish extraordinary things even when you feel fear. That's what radical confidence is being afraid and unsure and having a toolkit that allows you to still make massive progress. Pre-order your copy today because if you act now, you can claim the bonuses that Lisa has created for you at RadicalConfidence.com. They're only available if you pre-order, so act now. Then, once you've done that, we'll get back to today's episode. All right, guys, read the book and get ready to be the hero of your own life. Peace out. Yeah, so we're recording this not too long after the slap heard around the world. Um, and that to me is a, what, what I'm fascinated by is the context in which emotions are created. And so I think about it, I, I love your analogy of computers and robots. You literally wrote the character Data in Star Trek. Uh, and I know enough about Star Trek to know that Data was a purely logical creature, unlike Spock, who was half human and half Vulcan. Uh, enough seeps in through the public uh, or popular culture that I get that far. But um, and you were like, you know, it, I'm glad I didn't understand how emotions were made back then, because the reality is if he didn't have directives that we, we could equate to emotions that would compel him to act in a certain way, he would literally just sit there blankly and wouldn't even speak unless he had uh, a coded directive to speak. And so emotions give us that far more nimble brain that's able to have a sense of, I need to do something, I should move towards this or away from this, you know, towards pleasure, away from pain, sexual desire, whatever. And I am, maybe because I just have flaws in my own mind, I am way too aware of how a context can get created where somebody will think that it makes sense to get up in front of a you know large crowd in front of the whole world and slap somebody um which and people listening to this may think i'm out of my mind for thinking that that was crazy um but that's the reason that i have a i fully recognize that i must have emotions otherwise i will not be able to navigate this world so i i don't bemoan having emotions but I really try to be thoughtful about what contextual thing, whether it's childhood trauma, whether it's an argument that I got in with my wife this morning, whatever, the contextual clues that are changing the emotion that I'm feeling. And because emotions are so malleable, in fact, the subhead of your book is how our feelings influence our thoughts. And knowing that my feelings are malleable and that if I change, so going back to your transitive property, if A insinuates B, B insinuates C, then A insinuates C, there's something very similar going on at the emotional level that if I am um, feeling a certain way about something, then I'm going to react in a different way. That's gonna feel like the right answer. And so if my feelings influence my thoughts, then my thoughts influence my feelings. And if I can in some way control my thoughts, then in theory I can control my feelings or at least influence them. And so my encouragement to myself and to others is to recognize that it goes both ways, that thoughts influence feelings, feelings influence thoughts, and you need to inject yourself. I don't know that I would say you're injecting logic, but you're certainly shifting your context. Sure. I mean, again, you, there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll try not to go on for 20 minutes. But um, each emotion is a, is a state of uh, calculation, as I said. And I think when, uh, in that case, in, uh, where Will Smith uh, heard the joke that his wife you know, found, uh, I, I guess, degrading or belittling, that, that, that put him in an anger mode. So an anger mode uh, is known for certain qualities that it has. Uh, one is that it's, uh, it becomes much more goal-oriented. It becomes much more, um, you, you become much more risk, uh, willing to take risks. That serves a purpose in anger because usually anger is triggered by a dangerous situation. If you're not gonna take risks, you might not, 
get out of it. You might need to be bolder to, to handle the situation. This case, which is a rather artificial in the sense of what, what would have happened when we were evolving, uh, he, he, he did his calculation about what was said, how his wife felt, what would, would mean uh, to, to Chris Rock, I guess, to, to, to slap him, what it would, whatever the consequences would be. And he, he evaluated that under the uh, influence of this emotion state of anger. If he had been in a state of love, and one of my friends uh, is Deepak Chopra, uh, who, who is not one of my um, science colleagues, but someone who talks a lot about uh, the other side of life and, and preaches love and understanding. If he had been in that kind of a state, which I find Deepak sometimes uh, gets into ev even when, when he's in a tough situation and it helps him react in, in, a, in, a, in a good way, uh, he would have done all that calculation and done something else. He could have gone up and said, hey, you know, that hurt my wife. Mm. You know, that, that would have been quite a message to go up there and say that. People might have blamed him for being a wimp or not understanding comedians. I don't know. <laughs> that. But, but uh, he could have done that. So the, the, um, so the first part of that, I would say, is that it just illustrates how we should understand ourselves. And what he could have gained from was an understanding of I'm in an anger state right now. I'm doing a calculation. It's like a mathematical calculation. What's my behavior? What am I going to do now that I'm in this situation? Uh, and he might say, wait a minute. Let me try to understand what I would do if I was in a different state. Can I put myself in a different state? And there are ways. So the first thing is to be mindful and conscious of what you're feeling and what's driving you and understanding in that moment, I'm in an anger state. So alarm, I'm going to do something that is based on that. Is that appropriate or do I want to explore something else? So he may have decided that that kind of a reaction might be counterproductive, and that's why that's where we, come, we, we, we get to the point where, like you said, you can use your thinking to alter your emotions just as your emotions alter your thinking because it all works together. So, for example, in the book, I have a whole chapter on something called emotion regulation, mm. and that's where you, you recognize the emotion that you're feeling and, and that maybe that's not the optimal emotion to, to feel at that moment, and you, you seek to change it. It could be because you have a tendency to overreact, or it could be because you're reacting to a situation that's very unusual and you're not quite sure that that's the right way to react. And you fight. But the important thing is be mindful of how you're thinking and what you're thinking and how you might want to change it. So in emotion regulation, one method is called reappraisal. So in reappraisal, my favorite example since we're here in L.A., is you're, you're driving down the street and somebody cuts you off. And that tends to make people mad. You get angry. It's a funny thing to get angry about that because it doesn't really cost you anything. You're back another mm -hmm. 20 feet. You're going to be a half a second later <laughs> to your destination or something. But people get their ego involved and it, it pisses people off and they get angry. And if you don't want to feel that anger, there, there, there's something you can do about it. You, uh, th that anger comes from an appraisal. We call it an appraisal because as your brain is creating the emotion, it's looking at the situation that you're in, interpreting it in a certain way, and, and, and connecting it with an emotion that should, that's supposedly appropriate for that situation. So somewhere in your, your, your old reptilian brain, you're, you, someone getting in front of you is associated with, I'm angry, that's bad. Mm -hmm. So to reappraise it, though, you, you, you tell yourself a different story. You say, Maybe that guy isn't cutting me off because he's a schmuck and he doesn't respect me. He, 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 maybe he's got to go pee and he, he, he's desperate to get off and, and, and go to the gas station or to get home or he's late for a meeting and he's going to get fired or his kid is something going on and he has to get home or, which happens to me sometimes, he's just oblivious. The poor mm -hmm. guy does not realize what he's doing. Any of these other stories, you won't feel that anger really. You might feel sympathy. You might just roll your eyes, but you won't feel anger. And so if you which is what I really do, and it works. I tell myself those stories about the guy who pulls over, and I really don't get angry. I go, well, I'm, I'm cool, I'm above that, I'm not that petty that I'm gonna get angry, uh, it, it's actually just fine. And to do that in general, in a situation, to tell yourself another story to, to, that, that leads to a different emotion uh, is, is a very powerful tool, and that's called uh, reappraisal. Do you have a North Star that you use to determine how to reappraise something? Because like even when I think about the Will Smith thing, I'm guessing he had a North Star, whether it was protect my wife, whether it was I'm not going to let anybody mock me. I don't know. But he there was some, like you said, calculus that he was going through that 
either consciously or subconsciously, he had built a what I'll call a value system. I think think kindly of people. So don't you know, he could have thought kindly of Chris Rock and the guy's reaching for jokes. You have to be very I don't know if you read my book Elastic, which is about how you get ideas and creativity, you have to you have to lower your filters and, and, and be really wild when you're inventing uh, artwork or new physics or jokes. You just have to let it go. And if you're doing the jokes in front of a wall, that's one thing. And then when you're doing them on stage, sometimes they maybe they are inappropriate, but maybe he's just doing his best. Uh, but I think what Will Smith should have done, now, by the way, with the reappraisal story, it's putting a spin on it. It has to be believable. I'm not saying come up with something you, you don't buy because right. that doesn't work. But think of an, another thing you might think about this guy that would make it okay. So he might be thinking about that, that he's, he's reaching, he's thinking he's not funny enough, and he's just trying to throw in a, you know, a blast in another you know, great joke that he's coming up with. He's, he's, lo he's lo loosening himself up to, to come up with better humor. And this one didn't work. He, he probably regrets it. If I tell him afterwards that, that it hurt my wife, he'll probably apologize, and that'll be that. So something a little kinder, I think, if he had, if he had done that. I, I don't think that the North Star is really to think of, try, try to think well of people rather than ill. You know, and, and I'd say more than half the time you're right. I'll be like, I remember I lived in New York for years. I'd be on a, on a train, maybe on a, on a, on a commuter train because the subway is always noisy. But on a, I'm trying to work on my computer. There's a guy two seats in front of me on the phone, right? Yelling into that phone, <laughs> right? Just like, and I'm hearing about whatever it is. And it might be his uh, business ventures failing, his marriage is failing, whatever the hell it is. And I don't want to hear this. I'm hearing one end of the conversation. I'm trying to, to work or think about physics. Some, I just like to do physics on the, on the train. And you think, what an ass. And everyone, you look at, they're rolling their eyes, you know. Well, I would get up. And this, I did this on, on a several occasions. I would get up and I would go to the guy. And I, would, and I would say in a very nice way, not accusingly or criticizing. I say, excuse me, sorry, you, know, you probably don't realize this, but it's, you know, you're being a little loud and I, you know, I'm having trouble reading. Uh, and, and usually, not usually, all the times I've tried that, they're very apologetic and they quiet down and, and it's, they're not like an ass. So you, mm -hmm. you know, think, don't get angry and think that, that. Instead, think they don't realize how loud they are and that it's bothering people. When you actually go to talk to them, they're nice about it. So. It's a really interesting North Star. I know enough about your background um, to be intrigued, but for people that don't know, give us a little bit of background on your parents, whose stories are so insane, I can't believe they're real. Um, and I'm surprised, like, would your mother, would that ever be her North Star? <laughs> Leave my mother out of this. <laughs> it, it would not have been my mother's North Star. Uh, so my... Um, my parents uh, went through the Holocaust. Uh, my mother was in a, a, a labor camp like uh, you saw in Schindler's List, if you saw that movie. And uh, she went through the experience. I think all her friends uh, reject her, uh, spit at her, throw things at her. Jesus. Even before the Nazis invaded Poland, oh. the, the, the non-Jews, uh, and she was assimilated, so she wasn't in a Jewish environment. And they, and they would say, oh, wait till Hitler comes. He's going to get you. Jesus. Yeah, this is the way they were teasing her. And she was uh, 15, 16 at the time. And then when it happened, he, she lost her, fa her, um, her father. Her mother had already died. She lost her father and her sister, whom she really loved. And my dad lost his four siblings and uh, his wife and his child, a uh, young child that he had, and uh, ended up in the resistance, anti-Nazi resistance, and later uh, in a Buchenwald concentration camp. And he was liberated by General Patton. Whoa. And um, so I grew up, you know, I write a lot in my books. In my writing, I, um, it, I try to be as far as from a textbook as possible, as close to a novel or a, you know, mm -hmm. I like to tell stories. I believe in storytelling. So I try to make my points with stories, whether they're uh, from the news uh, or from academia or from my own life. Uh, I'd like them to be fine stories. They're either dramatic, funny, or just compelling, interesting. And I, you know, if they prove the point that I want to make, right. I try to introduce things with stories. And I've always used my family, my, both my kids. I have three kids and my parents. Uh, and, of course, I had a lot of extreme and dramatic stories from my parents. My father, um, on at least five or ten occasions, 
went through an experience where he should have died. And it's almost miraculous that he didn't die. And in various of my books, some of those stories come out. My editor at one point said to me, this is really weird with your father. People are going to think you're making this up. How could he have had so many close calls? Mm. And I say, guess what? You know, 90% of the Jews uh, from his town were killed by the Nazis. God, yeah. and, and everyone had that many close calls. And only the ones that, that survived those close calls had kids like me. Mm. Most of them, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth close call, they didn't make it. Right. And we're not talking to those people. But the fact that he survived almost guarantees that he has a number of close calls because that was what was going on in those days. And um, so in, in all my books, I have a lot of, I have, I, I, there are, I think, dramatic stories that I find that I can use to illustrate my points, uh, especially but the psychology. Given what but, your parents have been through, though, how do you end up with the North Star of think kindly of people? So my mother was uh, very fearful and pessimistic. And, and so it's not from her. <laughs> uh, and it was a hard way to live because she always felt that disaster was around the corner and um, if anything was good, it could be taken away from you tomorrow mm. with no notice, which is pretty much what, what happened. I mean, she had the proof. Yeah. Um, and that shows how context and earlier experiences affect the way you, you but that's another story. <laughs> that's, that's exactly that's my the, point yeah. is, um, you know, you can understand why she would be that way. And I can understand why you are the way that you are and having grown up not having to worry about that, I definitely err towards your side. But that context is ultimately constructed and I'm curious, were you <clears throat> building that construct because you saw, like, I think that. No, I, I think that, so I, first of all, I think I take more after my father in that way. And just he, he, he was an optimist. So my Even fa- after the Holocaust. Yeah, and that's how he got through it, I think. Whoa. He uh, he got through the Holocaust, which is interesting because there are people who say the optimists had a harder time getting through the Holocaust and those that, because that, they always expected things to change. And then after so long, they didn't change. They would get discouraged and die. But he had a certain spirit, and he he was head of the uh, military wing of the Jewish resistance in his town, and, and um, just you know had this indomitable spirit of uh, just charging forward, and and um, and when, you know he started out working in a sweatshop in the states as a refugee, and ended up we were lower middle class, but he wasn't in a sweatshop anymore, um, and I felt. I, I think I felt I always got a certain sense of heroism from him because I would hear his stories and I would feel like, well, I'm not in those situations, but when I'm when I'm called to do it, I should be heroic. So, mm. heroic might mean getting the top grade on the physics exam, you know, <laughs> or even going into physics where everyone goes, "That's a mountain I can't climb." Well, I'm going, man. Give me the flag, you know. So it, I always felt that I, I always took on big challenges. So I became a theoretical physicist, a Hollywood writer. Uh, uh, you know, a, a, a book, a book writer, um, things that every time everyone said, well, how do you, you just going to quit that and do that? And I go, yeah, I, I'm going to try. And maybe part of it was I was looking for those challenges because I didn't have the challenges that he had through mm-hmm. the war. And, um, but <clears throat> by chance, everything worked for me. And I think that's what I eventually made me gave me this more optimistic viewpoint because, you know, they told me, oh, you can't be a theoretical physicist. You have to be a genius. There's no jobs. And I got a job at Caltech. And then I quit physics, even though I've always, I should say, I still do physics as a hobby. I always have because I'm a theoretical physicist, so I can do it with just paper. I don't need a lab. Mm. But I quit that cold to become a TV writer. And everyone said, that's, you do. Cr- that's crazy. And I did that, you know, and, and, um, and then I, Ended up as an executive in computer games eventually. Uh, I moved from TV to computer games. I was an executive in New York, and um, when 9-11 happened, I, uh, we decided that I had to get my kids out of New York City because mm-hmm. they had a really bad, we were like involved in the middle of that. We lived by the World Trade Center. A- a- and um, so I just went in and quit my job one day and said, I'm going to California to, to write books. <laughs> and uh, I remember everyone was like, what? <laughs> Are you nuts? <laughs> <laughs> but then when everything worked, um, you know, eventually I, I got in my head that, oh, my dad was right. <laughs> and my poor mom, uh, I felt, had this burden of, of uh, pessimism and sadness. 
And I mean, my dad certainly had the sadness from what he lost, but, but he had this spirit of, uh, of uh, appreciate, enjoy, glom onto what's good that you have, that you, that you can stick Did to. Did they ever collide, your mom and dad, over him being optimistic? And like, was he ever trying to cheer her up? He, he did. She, she, she told me that he was a very good partner for her because he mm. saw things so differently. Um, I don't, don't remember any, you know, being privy to any of their talks or he might be right. trying to cheer her up, but I remember her, her saying that to me. Uh, he also was not around a lot because he worked, uh, left the house at 6 a.m., Sorry. Don't apologize. So that's no, I gotta I gotta put a spin on it. He had fun at work. <laughs> he would get back to like, you know, ten every night. So he had a kind of a hard life. Mm. And uh but yet he, he always was um he had a good spirit. Now knowing that he had a good spirit is is the memory hard because he just what he went through or yeah, the whole thing. I mean, uh, it's hard to talk about the Holocaust still for me, mm -hmm. and and uh, and then their struggle to make a life in the states, and uh, all that is tough, you know. And I'm 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 that proverbial first kid to go to college. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. So actually, you... first kid to finish high school in our family. So, really? Yeah, because they 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 got like a seventh grade education. Wow, man, it's a. Uh... I, because they were young, uh, when I first heard you telling stories about it, I, I don't know, just that that feels so like I don't feel like there's um, so many people connecting us to it anymore. But it's so visceral in the stories that you tell. It just made it feel so recent. It was very startling to hear the stories. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's going on in Ukraine today. And, and here here in the States, people are complaining because they have to wear a mask. Mm. It seems crazy to me. I mean, my mother had to drink water from mud puddles. She never complained about it. Yeah, it's uh, that's that's the thing about emotions that really intrigued me. And in reading your book was, it's just so potent that there's a sense of malleability to the things that we can change. And you're very careful in the book to point out this isn't about suppression. And if you suppress your emotions, you're going to have shorten your lifespan. And I mean, it's just bad news all around. But that there is reframing techniques. There are things you can do to put a spin, to tell yourself a story, the, a different story. The thing I'm always trying to I, I teach um, a class, if you will, saying this to a, a professor is, you know, feels very different. But uh, we have Impact Theory University, and I teach classes on mindset. And what I'm always telling people is you want to look for an interpretation of what happened that is both true and optimistic. And there are going to be things that are um, optimistic and fake, and that's a bad scenario. It's going to lead to chaos. There are things that are true and pessimistic, and there's certainly ways to interpret what you've been through. Like when you mess up, you probably really did do something that was stupid. But telling yourself that you are stupid because you did the stupid thing is not helpful and it's gonna hold you back. So you need to find that thread that is both true and optimistic. And the amount that that impacts your life, like, so I, there, I have one vice and that vice is stress. And I understand my relationship to stress and the reason that I'm able to, so I work right now, this isn't typical, but for the last five months, my typical is about 93 hours a week. Now I'm working, call it 110 to 120 hours a week. And my wife looks at that and just doesn't understand because she has a physiological response where she can't. Her digestion will get messed up. She at one point was like losing her hair and all this stuff because she, um, she does not handle stress well and she has uh, microbiome issues. And so she looks at me and just doesn't understand how I can work as much as I do, how I can carry as much stress as I can. But it's because I'm doing these psychological tricks is probably the wrong word, but that gets you close of I'm reframing constantly, or I'm doing something as simple as breathing from my diaphragm, which at a physiological level is lowering my stress, which because I'm then shifting out of, I use a, a, a cosmological term, background radiation. 
So my stress and anxiety creates this background radiation where I don't even understand why I'm, I don't feel right. So core affect, which you talk a lot about in the book. So my core affect will shift. I know something is wrong, but I understand how to get out of that at a physiological level. Either by, if I can pinpoint it and I know I'm worried about something specific, then I can shift the way that I'm thinking about it. If it's generalized and I can't grab a hold of why I feel that way, then breathing from my diaphragm will shift me out. But I am, I am so hyper aware that if I can shift that emotional context, I can change literally the, the entire tenor of my life. Yeah, that's true. And, and that's one reason I, I wrote the book, because people need to first become mindful like you are of that, uh, of what they're feeling, why they're feeling it, and that it can be changed and to know how you can change it and then to take steps to do that. And the mind-body connection is, is very important. It's very important in, in your emotional life. It's very important as an organism. I mean, one, one of my favorite stories in the book was, uh, there's a lot of weird ones, but this was the head transplant story that actually someone was trying to do a head tra transplants, to develop head transplants. Human head transplants? Human head transplants. Have, have they been actually attempted? Uh, they, ha they haven't they have been attempted. They've been planned and they've been done to animals. I was gonna say, I know they did a dog. Yeah, they, well, they did go. They did a dog. I think. I think they did a monkey. I'm trying to remember now. All the way. There's a whole history of head transplant, and it's in China that they're trying to develop this yeah. system for head transplantation. But what I what I found most interesting, and the reason I talked about it, was uh, one of the famous people uh, who was judging the this this possibility of this work. He said that that would not be possible because when you connected the new head. To the new to the other body, and let's say you were able to do it just perfectly, the the new organism would die just because of the mismatch of the of the uh, of the of the body, a new body giving its input to this head. Talk to me that's about not, the mismatch. That's not what? used to it. So because your body, you mentioned core affect, your your brain, we, we, uh, your brain is constantly reading the 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 health and the situation of your body, and that and that's a very big um, uh, source of how. How, what it decides to do, mm -hmm. and that that's reflected in the what they call core affect, which is core affect is a, a kind of feeling that you have all the time. It's a barometer of your or a thermometer of your health. Are you hot, cold, uh, sleepy, uh, thirsty? Or, or are you fine? Or is there is there is it something? Um, it has two elements. Uh, one is uh, good and bad, and the other is strong or weak. So are you in a good shape strongly or just a little bit on the good side or bad or strongly bad? And it, it, that has a great effect on your thinking and on the emotions that you develop because it's one of the things that feeds into it because the, the purpose of it is to read your body and tell your mind something has to be done or it doesn't have to be done. And, but there's a lot of other connections, that ways that your body talks to your mind. So there's, there's, there's all those nerves and those readings that are going into your brain, to, straight to your brain. There's hormones and other chemicals, bioactive chemicals that your body is releasing in different places. Your, your, your gut is very important. Your microbiome is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, these these are, have major uh, concrete effects on your thinking and on your state of mind. It, it, with in, in, in animals, they're, they're able to raise um, mice that have a pretty sterile digestive system. Then they take other mice that are either uh, bred to be neurotic and very nervous or, or very calm, and they take, they take their, they may do a fecal transplant of, of their poo from these mice, from one kind or the other, to the blank mice. And those mice, once they get, the, 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 once they get that uh, bacterial transplant into their gut, they become, they take on the, 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 the characteristics or the personality of the donor mice. So, the, so, so that if they get the donor poo from the nervous one, they, they're nervous mm. and, and, and vice versa. So, so your brain is, is so connected to your body. This person was speculating that if you just took a foreign body, your brain wouldn't know how to handle it. It would just be so confused it would die, mm. that the organism would die. And it's not from, apart from all the horrible physiological issues of connecting all the arteries and the nerves and everything else just this alone mm. the, the brain would not be able to, to, to run a different body because the brain and the body have grew, grown up and learned to like mesh together and you can't just pull one out and put it in another one it's not a module like that maybe a heart is is, is like that but not the brain do you agree with that hypothesis well, I, I'm not. It's not my place to agree or dis. As a scientist, I, I, I would only I would only on. agree or disagree you, if I had evidence. But but this person is an expert, and I, I, to, it sounds reasonable to me. And, and uh, I hope we never test it because I think yeah, that's the, the idea of. Uh, I mean, 
one could look more kindly on it and say, well, let's say we grew a body from your own, uh, can't be from no, your own but tissues. let's say someone died uh, in a motorcycle accident and it was brain dead, had a perfectly good body, and someone mm. else had some kind of cancer and had a perfectly good mind. And you might think, let's put them together. So, objectively speaking, maybe it's something that would be okay at some point, but there are so many issues, ethical issues, yeah. and and I, I would guess opportunities for abuse in that case that, uh, uh, I don't know, it's a very strange uh, thing to ponder. But I, I, I believe what the person said. I, I think that I take it for what, it, for what it's worth. It's a speculation. To me, what's, what's more interesting than whether or not it was, happens to exactly be true or not is that people might even, would, would even think that way, mm -hmm. would think that the mind-body connection is so important that you can't just switch out the mind and the body and have the organism survive. Yeah, the mind-body connection is really interesting. Lisa Feldman Barrett's work that you talk about in the book, I was blown away. I had never considered that emotions would have that sort of reciprocal feedback of like, what comes first? Is it the way your body feels and then your mind is just painting a rationale over that feeling? Or do you think something and that triggers a response in the body? And to be honest, so I had Lisa on the show and basically, I was like, all right, is it nature or nurture? Like, what's the difference? And she gave me a phrase that is just so powerful, which is, Tom, we have a nature that requires nurture. And I was like, damn, like it, your mind and body are in concert. Like there is no, to your point about the sterile rats, even something as, I mean, 20 years ago, we didn't even know about the microbiome. So something as late to the party of our understanding as that has such a radical impact and has other impacts in terms of body composition, fat loss, that kind of stuff, insane. And to think that there, there's so much more going on that we don't know, like our mitochondria, which are essentially alien cells, do they have communication mechanisms? I mean, cells deep inside your body can respond to light, which is already pure insanity. Uh, <laughs> there's just so much that we don't understand about the body but that we have this complex organism that controls so much of our lives. And we're just now beginning to really wrap our heads around, you know, what's going on when you think about that. So I come down to, I just latch onto the part that's malleable. How much of our experience can we change? How much of it to ask my famous question, how much of this is nature? How much is nurture? How much is locked in? How much can we um, spin, as you said earlier? Well, I think you can do a lot. Whatever you think you can do, you can do a lot more than you think. Uh, it's not a, uh, you, you can't 100% change things. And, and it varies from individual to individual. But uh, if you really are mindful and practice mindfulness, and I recommend meditation as well, and really get in touch with who you are, why you think things, what you think, what your tendencies are, uh, th then you can really take steps to, to, if you want to, to alter that and to change that. I, I have a, a number of, prof uh, 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 of questionnaires in the book to give you an emotional mm -hmm. profile, I call it. Uh, these are not self-help questionnaires, but they're questionnaires developed by real scientists who are studying these emotions. And they, scientists always, always want to quant quantify emotions or find out if, if you're feeling it or not and have, have some kind of objective uh, determination. So they, they've developed these questionnaires uh, that uh, you, you, you answer 5, 10, 20 questions and, and then you score yourself. It'll tell you what your tendencies are towards certain emotions because even though humans have the same emotional, we share the same emotional machinery, there's obviously individual differences just as there are in vision or, or physique. And, and, and a lot of that is also can, can be a result of your early experiences. So in today's world, in whatever state you're in, you can take this, uh, find out your tendency toward anxiety or fear or the other emotions that I have included there. And, and that's interesting because it, it, that helps you to know yourself. That's the, that's the goal is to know yourself and to go, well, I have a tendency to be anxious uh, or I tend to be anxious in certain situations. So I can try to avoid those situations or I can say to myself when I hit that situation, I'm gonna be anxious. It's, it's okay, I, you know, I'm gonna be anxious in that situation. Maybe remind yourself that you've been in those situations before and it was okay, like you're flying in an airplane. Some people are afraid of flying. If you, if you know beforehand that, you, that, you, that, that, that that's going to happen and 
you think about all the times, maybe study the statistics about how often people have flown, how rare the, 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 the uh, crashes are, how much the wings can actually flap in the wind, and that's fine. They're designed to be that or things like that, or just to have your honey next to you to hold your hand or whatever it is. You, 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 you do things to, to make that better. Mm-hmm. There's something, the, the cognitive behavioral therapy, there's different uh, therapies you can do you, uh, if you see a therapist. You can target certain aspects of your life that, that you think need improvement. So there's a lot of proactive things you can do, but most people don't do that. They just go through life uh, either you know accepting or being miserable or mm. so trying to suppress, which we've talked you've t- you mentioned suppression, which 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 is like makes you feel like maybe you're you're not feeling it, but you really are, and, and it's causing damage inside, and it's raising your cortisol levels and and it's going to pop back out anyway. So that's not the way. I would say uh, the recommendation is the opposite of, of that. Hello, my friend. You know that I believe success requires you to see failure as the ultimate learning tool. Success requires you to be disciplined and gritty and to never, ever quit on your dreams. I say all of that because one thing is certain, the road to achieving your goal is not smooth or linear. I wish it was, but it's not. It's gonna be bumpy, sometimes scary. Some days you'll take two steps forward and slide 10 steps back. And that's why success also requires you to know how to pull yourself out of a rut and get unstuck fast. Life is short. You can't be messing around with your goals. You've got to make progress every single day. So I've pulled a class from Impact Theory University called How to Get Unstuck, which you can watch for free with the link on your screen or by clicking below. When you join me for that free preview of that workshop from Impact Theory University, I'm going to teach you my strategy for how to understand exactly where you need to be going, how to identify the obstacle that's blocking you, and the best way to make the most progress towards that goal and keep your momentum. All right, click that link and let's get to work. All right, I'll see you on the inside. One of the things in the book that I was blown away by, and I've often wondered about this, is the wanting mechanism, which you did a better job of explaining than I've ever heard. And walk people through, one, what the wanting systems of the brain are and how wanting and liking are different. Because that was the example of the poor rat that they had, uh, you gave an example of in the book. I was like, that is drug addiction. Yeah, well, so all organisms have to have a way to approach their food or whatever it is that they need. A bacteria, it's chemical. They, they move on certain chemical gradients. They're programmed to, to do that. That's the, mo- that's the simplest. And more on multicellular organisms, more complex organisms, they tend to have certain rules that, they, that are programmed into them. Like uh, if you see uh, food, go toward it and eat it. It's just a simple rule, or it might be have a maybe more slightly more complicated because there's a maybe a certain uh, chemical that gets released into their body when they're satiated, and so it, there's another rule that says if this is above this level, go that way. If it's below, it go that way. But they're very simple rules. They call them. Uh, fixed action patterns, or in, in computers they call them production rules. If this, then that. A thermostat, for example. If it's over 80, turn off the heat. If it goes down below 75, turn the heat back on, or whatever it is. Those are simple rules, and most animals uh, live by those rules. Um, uh, even if they look like that, they they're not. They really are. Uh, I talk about in the book the example of a goose in a nest. And how lovingly, apparently lovingly, she will pull an egg from the grass back into her nest if it falls out. But then scientists have come and they put a, put a baseball there and she'll do it. They'll put a tin can there and she'll do it. She'll do anything. It's not a loving mother's action. It's a thoughtless uh, 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 fixed action pattern. It's a stimulus response uh, that, that, that is uh, programmed into her. And stimulus responses are really good if you're not ever a new or novel situations, um, if you don't have pesky experimenters putting <laughs> tin cans there. So for most geese, it's fine because no one's putting a tin can there. Uh, and geese still live in the environment where they're in a nest and so forth. If, if they got became urbanized and had a new way of living, that might not work for them anymore. Mm-hmm. 
So a more sophisticated, flexible way of doing things is wanting. Uh, if you have this wanting system, uh, th then it, it, it's more general and more flexible. So now I, as a human, w want certain things. They give me just pleasure centers in my brain, and I want the, the, something that they st when I get it, it stimulates my pleasure center, and it's kind of a, a cycle. And, and so that's how I, I, I'll eat, right? I'll go, I want food, I go to the food, I eat it, and other animals, they do the same thing. There's another way of doing it that's even more sophisticated that they, people found just recently, which is liking. So in the brain, strangely, want, it, and this is something that humans and maybe some primates have, but it's not really that distributed in, in other animals. Uh, it's, it's another step a level higher in sophistication. And think about it. Liking is a little bit less direct than wanting. Mm -hmm. Liking makes you want, makes you do it. Wanting makes you do it directly. So liking is, is, a, is a, we, it turns out that we have a, a system in, in our brains that, that um, is separate, that is a, a liking system as well as a wanting system. And this is just something that was discovered recently. And you, you can see the, at least the remnants of those systems as far down in, in mammals such as actually such as rats and mice. And the experiment you're talking about, they, 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 had a, they, they, they showed that by destroying certain parts of the brain, they could create rats that want something um, but, don't, but don't have the liking system or, or rats that like something but don't want it. So they'll have, a, they'll have a rat that you can tell it likes sugar because if you put sugar on its mouth, it, it makes certain faces that show it's enjoying it. But you'll put it, the sugar in front of it, and uh, it'll just sit there until it dies without ever going for it. It doesn't so have the crazy. wanting system. And the, on the other side, you can have something that has the wanting system that's supercharged, and, and, and you can see that it's going for something, but by the face it's making, it's not liking it. So it <laughs> wants what it doesn't like, or it likes what it doesn't want. So it, it, we've now studied those. We know what circuits those are in the brain. They're complex nodes of uh, systems in the brain that govern that for, for human beings. And you might wonder, why do we have that? But all, this, all these things I've been talking about, like emotion uh, and like the core affect and the wanting and the liking, are there to give you a more, essentially a more nuanced stimulus response mm -hmm. methodology. So what happens uh, with the pure stimulus response is something happens, I go for it. What happens if you have a wanting system is uh, maybe I get hungry or something, it stimulates the wanting, I go for it. With the liking, it's one step more sophisticated. Something happens and I like it, but then my conscious mind has a chance to intervene. So, so I like cheesecake. I see the cheesecake. And uh, now does my, but my, you know, I, I, maybe I would, if I didn't have the liking, I would just want it. But I have the liking that says, I like the cheesecake. I'm driven toward the cheesecake. My conscious mind says, You've, you're gaining weight. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then I, I managed to preclude my wanting system from triggering so I can get in between. I can make a more nuanced decision based on more, more nuanced, more complex situation and information. So each different layer in your behavior allows reflection and, and, and consideration of other, of other aspects of things that can, that can make you make a more nuanced or sophisticated decision. So that's the, 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 the dichotomy between wanting and liking in, in your brain. And, and we used to think that, uh, that they, they used to say that dopamine, right, what, what was your, um, uh, that was, was your um, liking chemical. Mm. And these people who, are, who have this study that found that dopamine is not connected with liking at all. It's with the wanting side of things. But that people didn't even know there was a difference. And guess which uh, neurotransmitters are connected with with your liking, you might you might guess it if you just think about the drug use that people do. Uh, opioids, opioids, and and cannabinoids. Yep. Mm. So when we smoking pot, That's we're hitting directly at the liking circuits mm. of our brain, and we like, and it, and it, and, you, <laughs> and, and, it, and and it feels that way. <laughs> but you don't want to overdo that because you know they can get habituated, and mm. and so you have to be careful because if you keep stimulating them too much, they become harder to stimulate. Yeah, an example you give in the book is, you know, drug addicts can get to a point where they don't even like the effect anymore, but they still have that craving and they go for it, even though like when they're doing it, they're like miserable. And why am I doing this? That's scary. That's scary. And that that's another that's a and, and, and this this work has a lot of application in addiction because that that is the human one of the one of the common human examples of a dissociation between wanting and liking, mm -hmm. showing that we have two separate brain 
processes for those two things. And those people who no longer like it or enjoy it, they still want it. And that's very sad. And, and you know, that's, they're trying to work on drugs to target that, to, to, to help people overcome their addictions. Yeah, the, the bifurcated model of wanting and liking is really interesting. So one, I've had that with food and then Rich Roll, I don't know if you know who he is, but he was on the show and so longtime alcoholic and has been sober for ages and ages and ages. And more than a decade, I think, into his sobriety, he had something really bad happen to him in one of his ultra endurance things. He'd been training for an entire year. He gets there and like uh, one day into a three day race, he starts coughing up blood. And so he can't continue. And he said, literally an hour later, he found himself at a bar already drinking. And he was like, I had no, no inclination of going, of like being excited to drink nothing. Just that, that compulsion, that want just drove him there almost unconsciously. And he was like, all of a sudden I was drinking. And I've had that with food. If something really stressful happens, I will find myself reaching for food. And I'm, I've, I'm so disciplined around food, so disciplined. And so I'm like, whoa, like if I find myself doing that, where I'm like that my, my emotions have become dysregulated and some part of my deep subconscious just knows like there, there is a thing I can use to soothe myself. It doesn't have anything to do with liking at that moment because I'm not even consciously aware I'm doing it. But there's obviously a want of like, yeah, some part of my brain wants it and it's gonna get it no matter what. And thankfully, I'm able to pattern interrupt that thing because I use rules in my life. So as soon as I find my hands on it, I'm like, what am I doing? Like, I don't owe myself calories at this point, so you know I have to put it back. But I just thought, wow, like now I get how people get themselves in trouble. It's, it is a non-conscious, doesn't have anything to do with like, you can have, and this, the thing I find most heartbreaking in the world is somebody who's obese eating ice cream and they're unhappy. And you can see they're unhappy. And I'm like, hey, eat the ice cream, no judgment. That's amazing, but enjoy it. Yeah. Like don't eat it yeah. and be like mortified yeah. that you're doing it. But once you realize there's a break between wanting and liking, whoo, the behavior starts to make a lot more sense. Yeah, and then you have to use your mindfulness to break, as you're doing, to break the patterns. That's what you have to realize, where can I intercept the pattern? Is, and is there a way I can deflect it, go in a different direction? Mm. The deep-seated nature of this, though, you elucidate in the book. The most hilarious, I don't know if that's the right word, example is the fruit fly. I, I, I still can't believe this is real. Walk people through fruit fly, sexual courting, and the response. This is bananas. <laughs> so it turns out that uh, when a male fruit fly uh, wants to have sex with a female fruit fly, it approaches, it approaches her. Uh, it does certain behaviors. It, it moves, it jiggles itself. It, it makes some noises too with its wings. It flaps around and she considers him. And, uh, and either will, she'll turn in a way that opens herself up to him or she'll basically give him a slap and go away. <laughs> Just kind of like being at a bar and I was comparing it to uh, my son going to a bar to pick up, to, you know, to whatever, meet someone, you know, that, that, as they do in that age. And, um, but what's really interesting is that, uh, okay, this is, uh, this is fruit fly behavior. And um, if you then take the male fruit fly after that and you, and you, and you put it in a situation where it can get either regular uh, food like glucose or booze, it'll go toward the booze. That's so crazy. It's a significantly more than, than a control group that doesn't go through the sexual thing first. Mm. They'll go for the food. But once this fruit fly has been uh, rejected, it goes for the booze, which just shows you on a, on a very, very, you know, fundamental, basic way what we all as animals share. I mean, we, we share neurotransmitters. We share mm. brain uh, organization and structure. I mean, I'm not that there aren't any changes as you go through the animal kingdom, but there's a lot of that basic stuff that we share. We, we share even the fact that there's emotions. I mean, I, this is a story about fruit flies so that was very amusing, but the same person who's studying the fruit flies talks about fear in fruit flies and studies the properties of fear in fruit flies and the commonality it has with the f how fear affects human thinking. So, uh, and you know, the DNA of the fruit fly is very similar to our DNA. So um, there's, there's, there's a, a lot of commonality that we have with very, very simple organisms. And, and that's, that, you know, that's good to, 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 to know because it, it maybe 
takes you down a couple notches in your human superiority complex or uh, makes you realize maybe to me uh, how close we are to nature. I feel more in touch with nature and other animals and plants around us because uh, you can see how, how much we're all the same kind of thing here on mm. Earth. What do you think about free will? Do we have free will? Well, no. <laughs> we'll stop. <laughs> As a scientist, look, you can play games with the definition of free will. And uh, there's different brands of free will that philosophers talk about. Um, the, base, the bottom line is that, uh, as any theoretical physicist would, would have to say, the, the um, uh, occurrences in nature happen according to certain laws uh, the laws that we're studying, that we know a lot about the laws. Uh, there are no exceptions to the laws. It's not like these, you know, the, the quantum mechanics works, except once in a while when you don't want it to work. <laughs> you know, so you think, no, I want to go left instead of right. That's I'm an exception. No, it, it's it's all being governed by by the laws of physics. And so if you believe that the laws of physics, they say that given any... Uh, state of uh, the world or you or everything uh, at any given time they dictate what that's going to be for all future times and for all past times and as Laplace famously said around 1800 if I had a big enough he wasn't talking about quantum theory but same idea if I had a big enough machine uh, or I knew the mind of God I could calculate uh, what the, the future or the past just by knowing the present and that's what the laws of physics say so if you don't believe that if you believe in free will, in other words, that, that, that you can, that if you believe that you can choose now whether to smile or not smile, uh, if you believe that's really something that you're doing that is not dictated by the state of the atoms a minute before that, then you don't believe in physics and in science and you think there's exceptions or there's ways to control it or make different things happen. But if you do believe in science, there's no room for that. But there is something that, you know, like, effective free will it feels like we have free will right mm -hmm. so i'm i feel like i have free will my system is so complicated that i can't know what i'm going to do next and as i'm as i'm doing things and making decisions it feels like i'm deciding but really what's happening is i because of who i am because of the body mind that i have uh, put me in a certain situation i'm going to do a certain thing nothing wrong with that i mean even think about Let's get away from the, from the pure physics of the free will. Think of the psychological free will. You put me in a certain situation, in a certain circumstance, I'm going to do a certain thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I see uh, somebody, you know, beating up some, somebody and I'm standing there, I'm going to go over and say something or do something. Or I'm going to run away, depending on who I am. But that, that's, that's not free will either, because depending on who I am, I'm going to do that thing. And you go, but, oh, you might debate it in your head and decide what you're going to do. Yeah, that's true, but who's debating? It's me. Who's deciding? It's me. So what's the answer going to be? Well, whatever I decide, I guess that's the answer that me gives. <laughs> so, I mean, what, what does the question of free will even mean? You know, it, it just means, uh, in a way, to me, free will is, 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 is learning who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. If I ran away or if I stayed, it's not so much that I made a decision to do that, that, I mean, I made a decision, but the decision was preordained, and what I and what was really happening was I'm learning who I am. Am I the kind of person who sticks up for the person, or am I the kind of person who runs away? I'm learning something about it, but whatever I was going to do, this person was going to do. And and so, from my own worldview here, or my own spin on all this, I have to say, or am I the kind of person that's going to change who I am? because I don't like the way that I reacted and I want to react a different way in the future. And this is a question I get asked a lot. And I will admit that the older I get and the more that I self-reflect and the more I engage with people asking me this question, I do wonder sometimes if I have an overactive wanting system because man, well, first of all, I should at least mention in passing, I don't know if I'll have time to get into it, but that determination is also a brain system that you can stimulate. And when you stimulate that person's determination system they all of a sudden they're like man i know i can do this i'm not going to stop stop what i have no idea but i know i'm going to do it i was like whoa that's very unnerving so because i want to take credit for the fact that i am extremely determined and i am extremely good at building desire in my life so when people ask like 
you know, Tom, I want to uh, achieve in the way that you've achieved or work as hard as you work or whatever. I'm like, you just don't want it badly enough because the things that I'm pursuing, you could very convincingly make a case that I am, I am pursuing it almost to the point of mental illness. Because once I latch on to something, that's that. And I give it my everything and I go, go, go. Now, not to derail, but I keep Buddhist style detachment in my back pocket so that if it ever becomes sort of unhealthy or I'm not enjoying myself anymore, then I would switch. But I focus on building that desire that may mm -hmm. start as like a sort of small spark, but I know how to fan the flames of that. And I walk people through it all the time. Now, for me, it's reliable. I can go through this process of building desire and six months later, I will really want that thing. But I try to get other people to do it and it, I don't, some people it works and other people it, it doesn't. And so I'm like, okay, well maybe you're just not running the process, but I know enough about neuroscience to wonder sometimes if it just, they don't have, they're not producing the neurochemistry at the level I am or the region of their brain isn't as big in that area. I don't know. Well, I have a determination uh, test or inventory in my book, I too. I scored right? off the charts. Did, okay. Off the charts. Well, there the you charts. go. I was only missing four points. Very good. Well, I mean, good. I shouldn't say good. It's not good yeah, or bad. Yeah, could be but, mental but, uh, health problems. Right. But so there are individual differences, and some people are less determined, and some people are, are more determined, and there's no good or bad or evil or unevil or, you know, good in the sense of good versus evil or good versus bad or... It's just people are built different. And if you want to change that, you can, you can work on that as well. But that's your, that's your natural. Fact, you talk about that. How do we, um, in, if we want to increase determination, this is one that I remember specifically from the book, how do we increase our determination? Well, w other than stimulating that network yes. with an electrode, right? Well, one thing that you can do is find things uh, find things that that you can attack that you you might want to do that you can gradually build build up um, uh, discipline with. So, for example, exercise. So, if you don't normally have a lot of determination and you've never been running, uh, go out and run, and go run it like a block. Don't push yourself too much. Just run something easy, a block, and then uh, it's important that it's not painful. And then do it again and do it again and do it again and then start raising it two, three, four. And what, what happens is you, you start to see that you can accomplish more. You start to feel what, what you get by accomplishing more. And eventually, hopefully, you'll get a goal of, of running a marathon or a half marathon or something that's, that's much longer. And that, that teaches you that, that you can accomplish things with the proper determination. But by getting those little rewards along the way, by whatever, it doesn't have to be running. Whatever it is, it could be baking or it could be quilting. The could idea, it? Because in the book, you use that example and you talk about BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. Uh, and I don't know if it's pure coincidence, but the very thing that changed my life was working out. Mm -hmm. And you can break my life into before I started working out and after. And I've always used it as an example of like gaining self-respect and like understanding how malleable we are. But when I read your book, I was like, is it the only way? Because man, the number of people for whom exercise becomes that life changing thing. So I don't know, is it? Well, exercise is one certainly that a lot of people have mentioned as being, as being life changing. But I think that if, if uh, it doesn't have to be the only one. And if you, if you look at other, in other areas where you can have, you don't have the same biochemical changes in your blood that you do when you're, when you're exercising, but you'll experience, uh, you'll experience the same psychological factors of accomplishment, of flow, ideally. You'll find something that, that, that you're passionate in, and, and you'll learn that, that you can achieve a lot by having the determination. Hopefully you'll get hooked on that. And do you think, it, so going back to flow, is that you're triggering the, the liking system where, ooh, I liked the way that I was of no mind as the Buddhists might call it when you're in flow, your internal monologue stops, you're just completely in the moment. And is that the thing? I, that I think flow, uh, and again, I, I'm, I'm a little beyond my pay grade here. I don't think this has even been studied. And I, I did know a Mikhail C., the guy who... Mm. Uh, Chick set me high. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, yeah. May he rest in peace. He just died recently. But um, he... Um, 
he came up with the idea of flow. And I, I think it's your wanting system that it's connected connects to. It's almost an addiction, hmm. um, at least for me. My own feeling is that I, I, I achieve that both when I'm doing my physics really deeply and in my writing. And in both cases, it's something that um, I can't describe anything else in my experience that's like that uh, other than drugs. Uh, something that... Um, what kind the, of drugs, <laughs> Leonard? Various drugs, but the I, my, my favorite drug uh, really has been a disappointment. I'm sure it's a disappointment. Is I love uh, alcohol. <laughs> so fair. So I mean, pot is good. I've had some other drugs, but but um, I may be old fashioned and uh, and and I so I, I govern how much I drink because I don't want to overdo it. I could mm -hmm. I could drink too much, and um, because you like the way it makes you feel. Yeah. Yeah, and I you know what you do is you learn to like the taste too. There's, uh, I think, a, a um, conditioned response there too. Mm. But uh, you think you like the way it makes you feel because after some point, it, you're habituate to it, and you don't even you're doing it because that's what you do to relax. Not that it is really relaxing you, right? But it's because that's what you associate with relaxation. Mm. And um, so I noticed that I, I felt like I, I mean, I never was like an alcoholic, but I. That, that I had a habit of um, every night having a couple of cocktails or something and sometimes having a couple more, you know, and, and, and I thought, well, I shouldn't be drinking every night, so I stopped it. Um, but, I, but that feeling of, oh, I, I, boy, a martini would feel really good right now, right? <laughs> that, that feeling is, is very similar to that. You know, when I, when I go to, to go to a state of flow, I just that, Ooh, that f would feel really good right now to be, mm. you know. And if your any of your viewers or listeners uh, haven't experienced that, I really that that's a part of life that I feel nobody should miss. Uh, it, it helps to have a passion, and I don't know. That's a very important part of life, and not everyone has a passion. But if you have a passion, that's the way to get into flow: is to just devote yourself, take away all distractions take away all time constraints. I go to the desert to write, I go to some place mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere sometimes and stay a week and write from 9 a.m. till midnight every day. Whoa. And uh, don't even eat. I eat breakfast at 9, so I start at 9, I eat, and I look over my work. I'll pick up something in the evening for later. I won't eat it, and then I'll keep working until around midnight, and then I'll eat my dinner, um, maybe have a couple of margaritas. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then start again the next day. And, and that flow that I'm in, though, is such a blissful state, even when the writing's not going well and I'm struggling with it, the, the, this level of concentration, the, the, the world around you, as you know, I guess you've experienced it, but it disappears. You, don't, you're, 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 you close down your sensory perception, and I don't hear stuff. I've, I've been in an airplane and in a state like that doing my physics, and eventually I realized the stewardess is like pounding my arm because I don't have a seatbelt on or something. And she said, what the hell's wrong with you? You know, you know why, why don't you answer me? I went, oh, I was on Mars. <laughs> Excuse me. That's you know? so interesting. So um, anyway. Yeah. So when you're in flow writing, w do you ever feel like you're channeling? Like the, the oh, yeah. ideas? Yeah. Well, yeah, you do. That's why, I mean, I don't believe in God, but uh, I, I think that woman who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, and mm. she said she used to get, I think if I'm getting it right, but she said that she used to get writer's block. And writer's block comes from uh, uh, a desperate, questioning yourself and being desperate to get it. And that's why one reason time, time um, constraints. constraints are horrible uh, because you, I got to get it done because I got to quit by then, you know. And, and uh, she said that she got past uh, that, 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 writer's block by imagining that, that, that she's not doing the writing God is through her and so so, so it, it's not her responsibility to get the thing done and if it doesn't get done it's God's fault it's whatever <laughs> God wants and then she it, it works and and I don't feel that way but I do feel like I'm channeling something I feel like that what, what I'm channeling is something in my unconscious mind mm -hmm. I'm letting it the filters go low and the stuff come out and I'm not worried if it's stupid or wrong or I'm gonna rewrite it or I'm gonna throw it away tomorrow I'm just there getting it out. Mm. And I can look at it later as an editor and, and decide whether to keep it or not. So I don't have to worry if it's good or bad, right or wrong. That's important not to worry about that. 
and part of that unlimited time is that you don't worry about because I have unlimited time. If, the, if you had unlimited time in, in life, you, you never have to worry about getting something wrong or not figuring it out because you'll just keep doing it till you get it right. And, and um, so that's a great thing. And, and um, so you get in that state. It, it's like a meditative or trance-like state where the outside world disappears. As I said, the sensory input is damped. You don't get, you don't really experience doesn't register very much. You're on a, you're on just a world consisting of whatever it is you're focused on. Yes, I know that feeling very well. It's um, I heard Stephen King describe it as channeling, and as soon as I read that, I was like, oh my god, that's exactly what it's like. I think you're right that it's just coming from the unconscious, but you don't know where it's coming from. Like all of a sudden, you just have these visions or ideas, and it's like, oh my god, like this is, I'm as much of a viewer in this or a reader in this as the person who's going to ultimately read it because it's, you know, just popping right. up into my mind. It is deeply pleasurable. It is incredibly bizarre and very fun. Addictive. Very addictive. And that's why I think it's connected to the wanting because the liking isn't so important in, the, in addiction, but it's, it's the wanting circuits. Very interesting. Leonard, I want more time with you, but I know we have to get you out of here. But man, where can people connect with you? I have enjoyed very much this talk and very much your book. Um, how do people connect or find your work? Well, uh, my website is L Miladinov, L uh, is Leonard Miladinov.com, sorry, <laughs> L E O N A R D M L O D I N O W.com, or my handles are L Miladinov, L M L O D I N O W for Instagram um, and Twitter. I'm not always great about tweeting or putting up stuff but sometimes i do and uh and uh i uh and it's sometimes interesting <laughs> but that's where where i can be found and of course my books are available everywhere amazing well after spending a lot of time with you i can definitely say um and and by that i mean i've researched you for hours and hours and hours and on top of reading your book that it is very fascinating and guys i highly encourage you to read the book emotional i will be diving into his other works i'm sure they are also amazing uh, and speaking of things that are amazing if you haven't already be sure to subscribe and until next time my friends be legendary take care peace the key thing is there's an animal part of our nature which is we completely take appearances for reality that's sort of the source of our problems and our misery to be honest with it, in life so the front that people present, the way they look, the way they talk to us, their words, we sort of take at face value. 